second panel session speaker is uh, Anirudh uh, Sharma, founder of Graviki Labs, and he will speak about how to turn observations into innovations. Mr. Sharma is uh, the MIT Technology Review 35 under 35 innovator and Forbes 30 under 30 awardee. Hi, my name is Anirudh Sharma and I'm the co-founder of Graviki Labs. Uh, Today, I'm going to take you through a journey of invention, innovation, experimentation, scaling some of those experiments up and uh, lots of failure in between. Um, uh, let me take you like a few years back, like like uh, 12 years back uh, in timeline. I was a first year engineering student and, and I reached the college in the hope that engineering would be a lot about engineering and building things, which is I was really fond of taking things apart and like putting them together to like build new things like every kid is. Uh, and I went to the school and I realized it was mostly about getting good grades and finding a job. I didn't understand most of that. And it, it, it sounded very dry. Six months down the line, I had two of my friends whom I, whom, whom I became really good friends with. And I used to see them mostly in hanging out in the labs. Soon, like a couple of semesters passed and I found myself mostly hanging out in those labs, uh, realizing that that I'm really enjoying the process of learning how to build stuff. But I think the same process actually showed up on my grade list, which was actually taking a huge toll. Three years later, like after so many semesters passed away, I realized I had like 18, 18 Fs in my engineering, which is 18 backlogs, KTs. And uh, I didn't see a point in completing it because even if you complete it, you probably would not get a job. And... Uh, then rather then let's just go back to the labs and focus on things that you're already good with I mean, that is building stuff uh, i mean i can brag about all of this now but back then it was hard because like everybody was on the path of getting a job and all you're doing is going to the labs and building stuff because you really love that and you get some prizes in in college tech fests and and uh, and those little shiny awards um luckily the the act of building and actually hanging out in the labs uh, but not getting a degree uh, got me really good at building stuff and and uh, learning how to code, learning how to observe things from a perspective of design and human experience. Uh, I got I got lucky enough to get placed in a company as a research assistant to a senior scientist who hired me to build some prototypes for him. That was in Bangalore, um, and uh, Bangalore gave me one perfect opportunity. It it it. On one of the times I observed that when whenever I used to go to my office in Koramangla, across the street, I used to see a lot of, there was a blind school nearby and I used to notice a lot of blind people crossing the street and walking around with the help of somebody holding their hands or a guide dog. That was the norm and you probably see them struggling with finding their paths. Now, it had a like that view in the head that there's always somebody required to make the blind person cross the street and make them go from one place to another kind of like had this weird spark in the head that here is one point where the technology has reached that now you can do Google Maps and you can find your directions from any point to any point in the world. But there's this section of the society which is completely not designed to use this technology. With that observation, uh, I went to the local market, bought like four really cheap vibrational motors, uh, came back, made a sketch that you see all these blind people walking around with canes, but what if we can use the shoes that they are wearing as a source of navigation so they don't have to depend on an external human being for their daily livelihood and to walk from one place to another. So I hope these four vibrators as you're seeing in, the, in, this, in this very early prototype in a form that is oriented as north, south, east, west, the way the compass is functioned. And I showed this concept to my manager at HP and he said, this sounds great. It's It's... However, the, I, I don't think you should be working on this because HP is not going to get, get in the business of making shoes. So Anirudh, you should probably quit this job and, uh, and start to do this outside. I mean, somehow I had landed up this job after my really amazing performance in engineering and, and my manager is asking me to quit it because I, I built this system. Luckily, I met somebody, I met Crispian, who was my co-founder back then. And he said, Anirudh, I think this idea is amazing. Let's give it a shot and let's launch it for the blind people. He was a very passionate engineer who also had a great sense of empathy for the, for the target user group. So we said, let's build a prototype. So the idea that it was in the head, like this sketch that you're seeing, we quickly took like within a week, we turned it into a prototype, took a regular shoe, went to a cobbler, asked him to cut it open, put the circuit inside, 
and can we show it to blind people and see what they think about it? The idea was that can you communicate the complex geo-navigational information like north, south, east, west into the shoe that can guide you from one place to another. Soon we started going around the country in exhibitions like this. I had quit my job and we were really passionate about this shoe we are designing with electronics inside and showing it to blind people around the, around the country. At that age, you're not thinking about money or thinking about how, how cool your design is. But then I soon realized that the design is not good enough because blind people said that, oh, your circuit is sticking out of the shoe. It's great concept, but it's not comfortable. And then soon we realized, Crispin and I, our team realized that, oh, it's not just about engineering it. It's about how the user feels about it. And then the moment you realize that you're not, that the, your concept is good, but it's not good enough, what you do is collaborate. We got exposed to uh, some friends of friends who were in the fashion industry and said they love the concept, but they, they want to help out with how it looks and feels to the user who's actually going to use it. So for three years, we conducted very deep studies with LB Prasad Institute of the Blind in Hyderabad. And then we came up with from that scary living prototype, that early, uh, early sketch to this finished system that actually was ended up being used by a lot of blind people around the world for use cases of not just navigation, but then later pivoted to becoming like a fashion brand that get later launched in Europe uh, three years later. So it's a shoe that guides you and also tracks your, tracks your gait, like the way you walk, the way you run and so on. I think the major learning in this whole process was that the assumptions and the innovation that you start with, once you show it to the user and once you collaborate would evolve and change in a way that you've never imagined it before. That's a process that I really enjoyed and learned a lot from. I was 20, uh, 23 at that time. The business was taking off. Uh, the team grew to like from two to like uh, 20 people. And uh, that time I got really interested in hum what, what does it mean to combine technology and human experience. So this interest for, for doing that took me to the MIT Media Lab. So Media Lab was, was like a blessing. It, it's like a mecca where you get to experiment with anything you like, you get to break stuff and collaborate with people who are extremely unlike you. So in a common day at the Media Lab, you would walk around, you would meet from a material scientist to a marine biologist to a cinematographer who are working on different areas of design and technology and get to collaborate with each other to create new innovation. Now, Media Lab was a great phase of three years in my life where I got to spend time with these researchers. But at a time that I realized where I'm originally from, which is India. And at that time, there was one problem that was always being talked about in India, which is pollution. Now, pollution is a huge problem. We always blame the government for it and somebody else to solve it. Now, we're not claiming that we can solve it, but we try to look pollution from a different perspective, a different lens. Like what if pollution could be a resource? Like, I mean, I mean we all know it's a problem, but like Buckminster Fuller, which was a great scientist, he once said, right? Like pollution is nothing but a resources we are not harvesting yet. But so if you look at it from that lens, we conducted a small experiment without thinking too much. Like that's one important step in innovation. Don't over plan, just, just try it out. If it works, great. If it not, move on. We tried this experiment where we would suck in candle soot because I was back in Boston, didn't find much pollution to play with. So here was a candle that could create a sooty environment. This is the way the pollution in, in Delhi or Bombay is like floating all around the air. Can we suck in this candle soot and add it to basic solvents like alcohol and, and vegetable oil? In this case, I use vodka and, and vegetable oil, which you found in every day's household and pump it through a cartridge and be able to essentially print from it. Here's an example in which this printer is actually able to print with pollution. All it took was one week to build this. It, were, it probably never worked the second time after like making this video. I showed it to the friends and they said, huh, this is an interesting take on the pollution. Why don't we try to address the pollution problem around India with this? Uh, now, inventing in America and airdropping technologies was something that I'd never related to. I wanted to keep my hands dirty and be on the ground. Packed my bags, came back. And a few years later, this is what we had. We started coll collecting pollution from different geographies and this is what it looked like. And the idea was the same, that can you turn this into different forms of resources that are out there? The same pollution that you saw from the candle is the same soot that comes out of various industrial sources, vehicles, which is rich in this carbon, which can be utilized as a resource. And going around the country, I realized there's so much of it. And 
that can be turned into high value products if you if you look at it from a different perspective after collaborating with a team of product designers and uh, and scientists we came up with a set of inks that can be used through writing instruments through screen printing through a packaging printing which is called air ink which is made by recycling air pollution so the learning here was that a weekend experiment that is done in a very quick and dirty way would take a long time to in in gestation to turn it into actual product and that journey is very interesting because you get to collaborate with people who are very unlike you and uh, and who understand the different business factors of this now we have created this product and now well, we wanted to see what's the market around it so one of the first companies that approached us was henikin you would think why would an alcohol company want to work with want to work with somebody who captures pollution amongst in the western geographies most companies are undergoing a huge pressure of carbon footprint and reducing their pollution levels so we thought how would it be if we capture their pollution and turn it into inks that they can use this became one of the most successful advertising campaigns that henikin ever did they took the pollution that we captured in india and china and gave it to some of the top artists around the world who painted more than a thousand walls around with it which became henikin's biggest sustainability initiative now this fusion of science art and technology got noticed by thousands of artists around the world who started writing to us that hey we want to replace the use of conventional inks and we want to use air ink into our art process the video for you guys we built this contraption that we connect behind the exhaust and the tail pipe of the car after we are done capturing the raw carbon the soot we take it through a purification process and then we convert that air pollution into printing ink the same technology can be scaled to fit onto boats chimneys and brick kilns and cranes but hey we've captured all this air pollution inside this little bottle and now you can paint with this So we've transformed air pollution into 150 liters of tiger air ink. So what you saw that came from that weekend prototype with the candle to what you saw in this video was good 3 years of work and uh, and a lot of money going into like failed R&D. There's an entire TED talk I did where where you should see like the prototype that you were building in in garages around Bangalore and uh, modifying cars and getting them to pollute to capture pollution to see how it works but then the commercialization of this happened in a way different way that we actually earlier imagined it from and that's what happens a lot when you are innovating from scratch because you cannot plan for innovation and and constrain it in business from the beginning soon after we realized that oh we started getting attention from almost all the most prestigious publications around the world air ink one time magazine's best invention of the year 2019 the first brand that we collaborated with Henikin which is an alcohol company and soon after as you can imagine the printing companies started taking interest in it the most inventive printing companies are the ones that who make apparel and who make packaging now packaging and apparel are both industries that are fighting a lot of pollution out there because fashion is a biggest polluter so is packaging and all of them started approaching us dell became our second customer dell prints 40 million boxes every 6 months out of air ink Uh, which is currently being done in china all the pollution that all the ink that you are seeing there is pollution captured from india and turned into materials that dell is using for their sustainability needs and they proudly say that our boxes are printed by recycling carbon emissions recycling air pollution and so on this is one then this scaling happened so we had completely built a new team around this that would handle the b2b and the scaling aspects of it and do this at, at a large scale more consumer facing brands such as mastercard who which gives a credit card in the hands of people they started using air ink to print their credit cards in sweden now every person who would use credit card in sweden would notice that this card is printed by recycling carbon emissions so not only it was a great way to to improve your sustainability in a measurable way for mastercard it was also a great way for mastercard to make the users aware that how much climate change and problems are out there waiting to be captured and turned into new products now that is my formula of innovation it's not just that innovation is about hardware about building things building ta- ta- tangible objects i think everyone all of us have to create our own definitions of innovation and how to innovate around constraints those who will not innovate unfortunately tough word 
they'll get obliterated like world war 2 last time like it's covid right now before this emergency like covid it was world war 2 not even the half of the scale of covid and so much innovation came out of that phase because you saw the gps the gsm and these big technologies getting invented during that phase so i think this phase is tough that's why we are doing this on a zoom call and uh, maybe the idea is to think about how do we use this new changing world to create new opportunities and new innovations that lead our businesses into the future thank you so much